Well, there's one thing for sure that we all have in common tonight, and that is we all have a name. And some of you and some of us even have a nickname. Uh, when I was growing up, um, I had close to red hair. It was more auburn than red, but still, I got a nickname because of that. I won't tell you what it was, but you can probably guess, right? Carrot top, I just told you. So there you go, right? <laughs> I wasn't really that orangish, but it came with the territory. I had some other nicknames, of course, as time went on. Our kids have had different nicknames. Our grandkids, some of them have nicknames now. Uh, you know, nicknames are interesting in that they, they actually give you some insight into the identity of the person. It may come from a certain situation that occurred or happened. It may tell you something about how they're wired or what they like. Isaiah, however, doesn't waste time with nicknames. He does something far superior in chapter 9, verse 6. He gives God names. Four of them, in fact. And these are names that will be given and identify the son who would be given, the child who was to be born, the ruler who would bear upon his shoulder the economy and government of God. Can I show you these four names? Because they give us a, a real inside look at the identity of the one who was to come, who was Jesus. In fact, will you say these four couplets with me? They're in Isaiah 9, 6, the last part of that verse. Let's read them together, can we? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. This is what Isaiah said in 9, 6. He said, this is what his name will be. Yes, the one who was the son who was given, the child to be born. This is his name. And what I find so intriguing and inspiring in this is these are all names that point to deity. They're names that refer to the activity of God, yes. But here they're ascribed to the one who was to come, Jesus. So it's saying to us in very prophetic but yet poetic language, the one who is to come will be God in the flesh. And so we see in Isaiah 9, 6, in these four couplets of names, just really some some beautiful, bright, and radiant um, markers about Jesus Christ's identity. Will you say that word with me? Identity. I want you to remember that word and I'm going to mark it down because it's the fourth a way or aspect in which we see Jesus' brightness during Christmas. Throughout December, we've been looking at Isaiah 9, the first seven verses, and we've seen so far that he is the reason Christmas shines brightly. He's the person that is the pinnacle of all of God's progressive plan. And when we look at Jesus more closely in this chapter, we find that there are four things that, that really, I wouldn't say make him shine brightly, but there are four things about him that, we, that are very radiant. His humanity, his deity, his authority. Those are the first three weeks. And now we're going to see his identity. And I'll look at the final three this coming Sunday. Can I tonight, just for a few moments, look with you at this first title, this first identity marker, that he is a wonderful counselor. Let's just look at that one for just a few moments. And let's try to explore those two words, can we? The word wonderful there is used about 80 times in the Old Testament. The vast majority of the times it is used, it refers to the Lord's miraculous works. And so the word really contains the idea of something that's supernatural, miraculous, wrought about and brought about by God. In fact, in the Hebrew language, which is what the Old Testament was written in, it's the word they have that is most closely related to what our word would be, be supernatural. And this is what wonderful means. Uh, when you think about the word counselor, he's not simply saying he's just a, an advice giver or a suggestion maker. The word is far more than that. He's describing someone who actually appoints and sets up plans that don't fail, who directs and orchestrates. And I think we have to understand that this kind of counselor, this kind of one who directs, appoints, and orchestrates doesn't fail because he is miraculous. The word that modifies counselor is wonderful. And so because he is supernatural, he's miraculous, then whatever he says, whatever he wills, and whatever he does is perfect. 
It's exactly what is needed. And so the, the author here, Isaiah, is saying about the one who's to come, in terms that are used for God, he says it about Jesus. He is a wonderful counselor. Let me just give you one more nugget about these two words. When you read them and, and you see them as an adjective and a noun, and so wonderful modifies counselor, and that's a good translation, but in the actual Hebrew text, these two words, they're both nouns. So we could literally and delightfully say the one who was to come, the son who was given, the child who was born, he is a wonder of a counselor. I mean, doesn't that just kind of light up your spiritual taste buds? I mean, Jesus, a wonder, a miraculous, a supernatural counselor, director, orchestrator. Isaiah 29 28 says this. Listen very carefully to how Isaiah uses these words. And I want you to remember, these are words he uses about God the, uh, about God the Father, Yahweh. It's actually 28, 29. Look what he says. This also comes from the Lord of hosts. He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. And yet those same traits are ascribed now to the one who's prophesied to come, showing us that, yes, the identity of Jesus will be that he is God among us. Now, a word that I like to use to describe this would be supernatural wisdom. This is what a wonderful counselor brings or does. He has supernatural wisdom. And this is what Jesus had. In fact, not only did Isaiah prophesy about this, but Jesus fulfilled this in a very unique way throughout his life. Several times in the New Testament, you'll read that Jesus exhibited uh, supernatural wisdom. He just knew things. He acted. He spoke with incredible divine knowledge. One of the instances that I find most remarkable, though, is in Luke chapter 2. It's when his parents were on their way to Jerusalem for their annual feast of the Passover time. Well, they lost Jesus on the way back. And so for about three days, they didn't know he wasn't with them. They realized it, rushed back. They found him in the temple. And when they walked in, here's what Luke records they observed. That all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. That's a wonder of a counselor, isn't it? And in fact, I'd encourage you to remember, who was in the temple with Jesus? It wasn't like the nobodies and anybody's. I mean, they were all the somebodies, right? These are the religious architects of the landscape there in Jerusalem. These are the folks who are supposed to know the law and the prophets. They were the ones who could, who, who could design exactly how you should operate and act spiritually, right? And they were the ones who were amazed. They were the ones asking the questions. And Jesus, as a 12-year-old boy, was astounding them with supernatural wisdom. Why? Because he is a wonder of a counselor. And so, in all frankness, here's the simple truth tonight. We've been looking at all the ways that Jesus really makes Christmas shine brightly. Well, tonight, let's just say the truth as it is, that Christmas shines brightly because of the identity of Jesus. And we're seeing tonight, namely this, his supernatural wisdom. This is good news for you and I who don't have supernatural wisdom who sometimes don't even have wisdom, okay? We make a mess of things. We find ourselves in a world of trouble and behind the eight ball, whatever analogy you want, you want to use. That's why it was not only good for God's people in that day, it's good for God's people today that Jesus, our Savior, is a wonder of a counselor. So tonight... If you're feeling spiritually unfaithful, physically weak, unstable, undone, alone, emotionally barren, waiting, bitter, broken, fearful, guilty, hiding, just nothing left at all. If that's you, I bring you great news glad tidings. Jesus, who was born in the manger, 
is a wonderful counselor. He knows exactly what you need and what to do. Those words I just mentioned, those words that can sometimes be an adjective or sometimes a noun, unfaithful, broken, bitter, tired, weary, all those words I just mentioned, I mentioned them because they're precisely the words that were used a few nights ago in a song that Julie and I heard. We had just finished reading our Advent um, scripture for that night. And so we played a song. And uh, as it was playing, sometimes we'll talk, but on this night, we just, send, we just sense we should just listen. And, and it rattled off all these words. You know, the words that describe you on your worst day, not your best day. The words that seem to... Uh, recount events that you want to forget, not remember. The song finished, and there was a few seconds of silence. And I said to her, I've been every one of those words to the Lord. And most of them to you, probably. At some point in my life, every one of those words would describe me. I was feeling overcome with just spiritual nakedness before the Lord. I looked at her, and, and she was nodding. She was a little worrisome at that point. You're know, like, okay, uh, what's going on here? But then I realized she was nodding, but she was agreeing. Yeah, we were both just exposed before the Lord. It was a starkly revealing moment for us as a couple in which in front of us was every bit of our neediness. And yet at the same time, every bit of Christ's sufficiency. It was just kind of all in the spiritual crockpot of our heart at that moment, which is probably why she said in a very timely way, she said, you're right, but Jesus is everything we're not. And he stood in for us, and he knows exactly what we need and what to do. I mean, it was a memorable moment of worship for me and Julie. To realize that needy sinners who, who really don't know what to do, and when we do, sometimes we do the right thing in the wrong way, and sometimes we simply do the wrong thing, that we have a Savior who is a wonder of a counselor and knows exactly what we need and exactly what to do and is directing and orchestrating and ordaining so that it's always a perfect fit. That's Jesus. And I urge you tonight, Trust in his perfect supernatural wisdom. As soon as she said that, of course, I thought about this verse in 1 Corinthians. Where Paul actually calls Jesus the wisdom of God. And, and, and in that moment, we just both realized everything we need, every solution, uh, every answer is in a person. Jesus, he was born. He came, historical time and space. He's the wonderful counselor. And though the world may look at that as foolishness, the world may say, well, that doesn't make any sense. How can that work? How can that be? I'm going to fall at the end of the day on the wisdom of God who sent Jesus. Because you see, not only is God a wonderful counselor, that was revealed in Christ who was God in the flesh. He too is a wonderful counselor. He's the one who perfectly ordains and plans and fulfills, and can I say these words, advises and counsels in a supernatural, miraculous way to lead his people. I would ask you tonight to do the very same thing. Fall on the wisdom of God. Lean on the perfect counsel of Jesus. I realize I'm speaking tonight probably to a lot of Christians who have done that at a certain point in time regarding your salvation and your, the forgiveness of your sins. You saw Christ <clears throat> uh, and you heard him preached. You, you heard Christ preached about him dying on the cross, and forgiving our sins through his death and resurrection, and you believed. And from that point on, you've been trying to trust Jesus and, and growing in your faith in him. And you know, that's awesome. Tonight you're saying this is helpful, Todd. Understand what these words mean. I'm, I'm gonna just, this is a good nudge to continue to trust God. I'm, I'm thankful for that. But can I just in the closing moment speak to those who've never trusted Christ initially? In fact, 
If you were pressed in a corner, you would say that you're trusting other things. Perhaps how much money you have, maybe the good life you're living, maybe the good last name that you received from your parents, or maybe the fact that maybe you were baptized when you were a few days old and you think that's going to count with God. You have all these ideas about, from your own wisdom about how people kind of get right with God, how they can get to where God is. The problem is all those ways leave out the wisdom of God because the wisdom of God is Jesus. And any way that leaves out Jesus isn't wise, but foolish. And I invite you tonight especially to, for the very first time, put aside man's wisdom, the culture's thoughts, and instead hear God's wisdom that one person Bridges the gap between God and man. It is Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God. Yes, the world looks at that and thinks it's foolish. They ask, how can one man stand in for all sinners? Well, you're right. If that one man is just another better version of us, he can't. She can't. But when that one man is the God man, Jesus, he can and he did. And Jesus Christ is the only way to God. And tonight I ask you to repent of believing the world's wisdom and to turn in faith and trust in the wisdom of God, which is the person of Jesus Christ. Turning and responding to the Lord in that way, believing in Jesus, would, would sound something like this in a prayer. Heavenly Father, I believe that you sent Jesus as the only way to be saved. And I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that, that he died, was buried, and rose again. So Lord, by your Holy Spirit's power and based upon your word, I confess Jesus as the only way to be saved and I put my faith in his wisdom. Would you save me tonight? I stop leaning on my own understanding and I trust you completely. When that's the response of a heart, and again, it may sound a little different because words don't save us. In fact, prayers don't save us. Jesus saves us, amen? But often it's a prayer like that that shows the Lord our heart. And so a prayer like that saying, God, yes, I trust you, not myself, others around me, or the world or the culture. I trust you. God, would you save me through your wisdom, which is Jesus? Then God responds by doing exactly that. He saves you. And he gives you what the Bible refers to as the gift of salvation. It's the best Christmas present you'll ever receive. And if tonight, you prayed that while you're sitting in that chair. Your eyes can be wide open. You can be thinking, hopefully you are with me. But if while I said that, you were like, that's my heart. That's what I'm praying tonight. I want to trust Jesus, not myself or others of the world. I want God to save me through his wisdom, which is Jesus. Would you just text these words to 94,000? Would you just text, I got saved to 94,000. In fact, I'll ask you this. Text that before you leave the building. If you put it off, so I'll do it later, you'll probably forget and you won't. But it's tonight in your heart. You're like, that's the response I gave to God upon hearing the message that Jesus is the wonderful counselor. He was God in the flesh. And he was the one who provided the only way to God perfectly. Just text, I got saved to 94,000. I'll get that text. I'd love to know that and rejoice with you in the best Christmas present anyone could ever receive eternal life through Jesus.